Hi all, welcome to the session on six underrated responsibilities of product managers. Um, I'm Bhushan Mughal, I'm a product manager at Google. Uh, let's get right into it. So a little bit about me, uh, I started my career as a software engineer, uh, switched to PM uh, product management at a startup. Uh, and uh, for the past almost about three years, uh, I've been a PM at Google. Um, my background, uh, for the most part is in the data and analytics domain, uh, specifically cloud data analytics. Uh, and a large portion of my experience has been uh, in the B2B business. Uh, about my journey as a PM, uh, it's been a, a fun ride, uh, but it has come with a steep uh, sort of ongoing learning curve. Uh, mentors have helped me navigate uh, this learning curve as well. Um, and Based on that experience, uh, I I am also passionate about helping uh, you know other PMs and, and prospective PMs as well. Uh, and a fun fact about me uh, is I love memes. Uh, picture is worth a thousand words, um, so you'll see some of that during this presentation as well. So about the session today, uh, we'll run uh, through a little bit about why product management sometimes seems like an enigma. Uh, often misunderstood as well. Um, then we'll jump straight into uh, the main topic of today, uh, which is uh, the under underrated responsibilities, uh, or they could also be core competencies or skills that uh, a great PM brings, brings to the table, right? Um, and then uh, we'll get deep dive into each one of them, uh, and then uh, a few links for uh, follow through. So product management, uh, we all know that's a it's an extremely critical role in the industry today, uh, especially in the tech industry. Um, but it's also uh, very often a misunderstood role. Uh, there, is a, there is an overall sort of general understanding of what a PM brings to the table, uh, what are uh, you know, their roles and responsibilities. Uh, but uh, there's often a lack of clarity. Uh, there is a tendency to oversimplify a PM defines what to build, when to build it, uh, and that's that's what they do, right? Um, there's a lot of misconceptions and myths about this as well. Um, a whole lot of, uh, you know, industry experts have written uh, various articles on you know, myths about uh, product management uh, and, and, you know, sort of try to debunk them and, and provide factual evidence as well. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, along with that, there is a topic of today as well, which is uh, there's a there's a lot of responsibilities or core competencies that a PM uh, should have um, that are often very underrated. Uh, people don't talk about them as much, right? Uh, and and that's that's the topic of uh, today's discussion. So, what are these uh, core competencies or responsibilities that I'm talking about, right? Um, their, their nature is they're 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 very subtle. Uh, they're hard to notice. Uh, you sometimes take them for granted, but uh, you know a, a PM is actually putting in a lot of effort in order to uh, you know do his uh, do those parts of his job as well um, or, or their job as well. Um, th these responsibilities are also understated. Not a lot of people talk about them. Um, they're also complicated. They involve uh, making hard decisions, uh, they, they may also come across as harsh, uh, very difficult to navigate as well. Uh, we'll talk about some of them as well. Um, and then in general, there is a sense in the industry that a, a PM is a very glamorous role, uh, but uh, some of these responsibilities that we'll talk about today uh, are also very non-shiny, very non-glamorous, right? Um, and then because of all of this, uh, it might seem a little bit daunting, but there are you know, sort of ways to navigate all of that as well, right? But having said all of this, uh, these responsibilities are extremely critical and go a long way in making a PM a great PM. Um, the other thing that I'd like to talk about a little bit uh, before we jump into uh, the responsibilities um, is that these may, very, uh, a PM is in general, product management is in general a very fluid function. It can vary from industry to industry. Uh, it can also vary based on company size. It can vary 
uh, based on the business that you are in B2C, B2B, et cetera. So some of these responsibilities may uh, appeal and be more important in one of those areas uh, and not the others, right? So take, take them, uh, not every role is the same, right? Um, so let's jump into the first one, right? Um, so there is this conception in the, uh, in the industry widely that a PM's job is to keep building new things, keep proposing new things, keep defining new things. Uh, figure out what to build next always and, uh, and and just steer the whole ship across functional team towards uh, those goals, right? Um, they are also expected to be very, very visionary. Uh, they're supposed to think about the future, uh, where the industry is going, et cetera. But what goes unnoticed is in between all of this, a PM is continually making incremental progress. There are certain laid out visions, strategies, uh, certain features that the team has embarked upon. Um, and towards those things, uh, a, the, the, an essential part of the PM's job is also to ensure that incremental progress is happening, uh, that the needle for the user in, in those known scenarios is moving in the right direction. Uh, the user's life is, customer's life is uh, improving uh, in those you know, existing uh, features and capabilities that you've already defined. Right? Let's talk a little bit more about uh, incremental progress, right? Um, there is, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, there is a tendency uh, in the industry to focus solely on uh, the next big thing always, right? Uh, that's also how, uh, you know, you would find back in the day, uh, even uh, PMs have judged their performance is just based, based on how many launches they make, uh, what you know, big splashes they make, etc. Right, and as a result, there is a tendency among PMs to to keep proposing new features and, and building new features. Right, um, there is also uh, a massive feature FOMO as they talk about. Hey, what if I don't build, and what if my competitor builds this? Right, uh, I may lose out on a market segment, uh, an opportunity, etc. Right. Um, but having said all of this, uh, one thing is also true, which is uh, uh, customers and users expect some sort of consistency as well, right? Uh, once you've given them a set of capabilities, they want to have uh, an assurance that you're with them on that journey. When they use that capability, that uh, if they run into problems, that, that you will be there to support them, uh, as well as you know that that specific capability that they are using, uh, you know, keeps making progress over time as well. Uh, it cannot be you know stagnant. Um, so what happens a bunch of times is also uh, there is this uh, what I like to call as throwing across the wall sort of mentality, which is I, I as a team as a uh, as a product manager even or as a company you're building features and throwing them across the wall the customer right. Um, without and, and then you know immediately moving on to the next big feature, right? Uh, this can have, uh, due to the reasons I mentioned before, uh, an adverse impact on customers. Uh, but more importantly, it can also impact your own product team's morale, your own engineering team's morale as well, uh, because they're constantly you know doing the switch uh, between uh, you know different features and capabilities uh, without actually realizing how the work that they do makes a difference to the life of a customer, right? Uh, it also creates, you know, hodgepodge and Frankenstein, Frankenstein type products where it just seems like a whole bunch of features have been thrown together without uh, clarity on, you know, what the product needs to be. Right? Uh, it triggers positioning uh, problems uh, and can have uh, a very negative impact, right? Um, instead, one of the characteristics of, of a PM is that they will, they know that big ticket items will come, uh, you know, few and far in between, but in between those, they will iterate constantly on customer feedback, right? Uh, they make incremental progress. Uh, and, and then by doing so, they will ensure that the things that they propose and define and, and ultimately end up building, create sustained value for users. Uh, and, and not just you know in the immediate future, but over a sustained amount of time. Right? Um, 
So how do you go about doing this, right? Uh, we'll talk about this in, in, in some of the future slides as well, but uh, the, the key job of a PM is to establish the rationale for every single feature. Right? Um, product discovery, as, as they also spoke to speak about, is, is, is extremely key. Uh, and it doesn't have to always uh, play a major role only when you're launching a net new product. It could happen for every feature as well. So uh, before you embark on a feature, uh, a PM must have sufficient clarity on why it is being built, what problem it is being uh, it, it's solving, why is it necessary to build it right now, and why should we as a product team be building it, and why not someone else, right? Uh, they should also be concerned about whether we as a team have the capability, whether it is feasible for us to build it, whether we have the skills, whether it is in our uh, product's vision to build it, right? Uh, and once that is established, whether we can put a stake in the ground and say that we will have a continued investment in this capability over a sustained period of time. Right? So it, the reason why this is important is also it also enforces uh, that uh, frequent changes uh, if, if you continue to make these frequent changes, uh, they, they can also indicate a lack of focus and direction and again, have that adverse impact on um, you know, both your customers and your product team. Right? Um, and, and so it is the PM's job to keep not only customers, but also their management team, as well as their, the product team that they work on, focused on a vision, focused on a set of objectives for a sustained amount of time and keep plowing through iterating uh, in in that uh, you know direction for a sustained amount of time. Cool. Um, so let's move on to the next one, slightly related to the first one as well, um, but a little bit more focus on on that rationale, that justification, right? Um, so it, it, there's a, there's a misconception also in the industry, which is uh, it is the PM who comes up with all the ideas, right? Which is couldn't be further from the truth, right? But, but what is definitely true is a PM does bring the rationale for every single idea. That is their core competency. That is what they bring to the table. Uh, that is their foremost responsibility. They need to know why a particular thing on their roadmap, why a desired outcome is important for the product to achieve. Right? Um, they may not be the source of all the ideas, but they certainly uh, are responsible for the rationale. So uh, the, the way I look at it is uh, there are three components to every uh, feature capability product, right? Why we are doing it, uh, what is it, which is, which is the solution itself, uh, the why is the problem, the what is the solution, and the how is essentially, uh, you know, how you're going to solve that problem, right? The actual implementation. Um, so while the, the ideas can come from customers, they could come from stakeholders, partner teams, product teams, et cetera. It is a responsibility of the PM uh, as to no matter where the idea came from, uh, they must establish why that idea is important. Why is it important at a particular point in time? And why is it important for this particular product team to do it, right? Um, and, and it's not just about having this concrete picture in their minds, it's about also communicating that and having consensus, building consensus about it as a whole, right? Across this entire spectrum from customers to stakeholders uh, to, to the product team and, and, and having them focused on this, uh, you know, giving them the clarity that is needed uh, for them to be focused in this direction. Um, so the, the way that typically product managers do is, I uh, achieve this is have you know a, a great story about the rationale of every single uh, functionality or capability, and then you know move on to sort of communicating that uh, in uh, using you know exemplary communication and negotiation skills uh, to the product team to all the stakeholders, uh, and you do that based on uh, you know the why that you've already. Uh, established and, and, and the data to back that as well, right? Uh, and the idea is, unless you have this, 
unless you have the why established, do not move on to the actual solution itself. Uh, do not move on to how uh, that, that comes after after the why, right? So th there's also a, a, a way to look at the rational and the justification and the why uh, as an essential part of uh, what we call as the product discovery phase. And then it is absolutely paramount that uh, that that the PM uh, does a thorough job, leads the team. Uh, you know, engineering can participate, UX can participate, documentation can participate. But as a team, you establish the product discovery process, and only after you've made sufficient progress in that, you have uh, absolute guarantees that yes, this makes sense. Uh, that is when you move to designing the solution. Right? Uh, th there's a there's a great book, in fact, on this uh, by Simon Sinek called uh, Start With Why. I highly, highly recommend uh, everyone to read it. So the next uh, underrated responsibility is uh, that there's this notion again that PMs decide what to build next always. That's their focus. But one thing that goes unnoticed is a PM needs to pay an uh, equal, if not even greater attention to uh, what exists in the product uh, that you know maybe doesn't make sense today, right? Um, uh, and there's a there's far-reaching implications of that. Uh, you know there has been a radio focus on this of late at uh, at at large companies because uh, you know ultimately this is what drags entire teams down. Uh, so so let's talk a little bit more about that. So we've all discussed before it. Uh, uh, Customer needs and market conditions uh, are very fluid. Right? What is true today, the sense of the world uh, as it stands today may not be true one year from now, two years from now, two years from now, et cetera. Right? So it is a, extremely important to have a tab on uh, the capabilities in your product, uh, who is using them, how much are they using them, are they important even today? Uh, because uh, again, I, a lot of product management is about decision making, right? What do I build? Uh, how do I build it, right? Um, and you make those decisions oftentimes uh, based on point in time information. Like what do you know today? Um, that point in time information may change in the future. So you, you need to be able to capture all of uh, your decisions and then be able to go back, correct things uh, as well, right? Um, so like I said, uh, Things that provided value, substantial value, today may not provide value, you know, a few years down the line, a few months down the line, even right. Um, and uh, it is crucial for a PM to maintain a tab on that. Um, this is also a, a very hard thing to do, right? It's it's a hard decision to make to 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 stop a feature. Uh, not only hard uh, about you know, how to communicate this to your team, but even harder about, hey, well, how do I go about figuring if uh, you know, users are still using it, right? Uh, even if, you know, a small number of users are using it, how do I focus on steering them away from this into something uh, that is much better for them, perhaps, right? Uh, so those conversations are, are very critical. Uh, this is why communication is, is such a, such an important aspect of uh, product management, right? Uh, and if you get this aspect of shedding dead weight, uh, if you have a good tab on this, there are a lot of benefits. Uh, and of late, you will see that uh, product managers really get a lot of recognition if if they, they if they do a good job of this, right? Because um, at larger companies, for example, this has the benefit of consolidation. Sometimes when when you decide that when there are a lot of parallel efforts, uh, you know you you, you sunset some efforts, uh, let, let someone else take that, right? And uh, in general, lead to consolidation, free up uh, resources, et cetera. Uh, there's also an even bigger thing here, which is uh, an even bigger uh, benefit of this, which is you keep a tab on the tech and product tech in your in the product, right? and, and you'll get a, a product appreciation across the board from this, right? Uh, you, you will have, uh, that uh, sense from the from the engineering team, especially uh, 
it's, it's very important here uh, is where um, they will have a sense that you are a trusted partner you, you think about their objectives as well right um, so that's why this is this is critical as well and then in general uh, it keeps your product surface area under check right it, it ensures that you don't you know blow up into frankenstein types of products where you know you just uh, thrown features together right and how do you go about doing this is there, there are essentially two things right one is you need to have uh, sufficient metrics uh, in order to understand uh, the usage of your product uh, and it has to be sort of as granular as humanly possible right which is collect as much data and then spend a lot of time sort of uh, weeding through that data and, and gathering insights uh, from it around the product usage etc right um, and then once you've established that hey you need to think about certain features and discontinuing them then you need an immense sense of empathy uh, you know customers may have invested a lot of time in those features uh, even if it is important to a single user uh, a single customer um, you need to tread that path very very carefully uh, ensure that you have the best interests of of the customer in mind uh, before uh, and and you you guide them through um, sort of a process by which they transition into uh, you know something else for example right um, so as long as you handle those two uh, i think i think uh, this is something that that uh, that a PM can 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 do a good job at. Right, let's talk about uh, the next thing here, right? Which is, um, yes, a product manager represents the voice of the customer, uh, but more importantly, uh, you know what great PMs do is they develop this relationship with their key customers, where uh, customers think of them as their trusted advisors they they rely upon your word uh, you know they, they put great value to your word your opinions uh, and, and this is done you know even at the highest levels at the customer itself right um, and this is very very useful because um, this then even when you have to sort of walk away from a certain uh, requirement from a customer for example um, the customer has that confidence in you that you're, you're actually doing the right thing and guiding them, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, so one of the things that is essential for uh, every PM to understand is that the success of their product, which is what every PM shoots for, right? Uh, that needs to be a byproduct of the success of the customer. It cannot be the other way around, right? Uh, when you have conversations with with customers, uh, those conversations have to be focused more about uh, the customer and their problems than you know just about your product, right? Um, you have to have that, uh, and, and and it is actually important for for you to not to just do this, but uh, for the customer to know that that this is your thinking as well, that that you have a keen interest in solving their problems and not just in sort of selling a product to you, right? Or uh, releasing a new feature to you, right? Um, so how, how PMs usually do this is, uh, you know, a lot of the conversations are focused on customers and their problems, right? Uh, in these, you know, uh, sometimes this may be difficult, but, but some PMs also go to the extent of, observing the customer uh, you know go about their work their day-to-day -day life uh, in their environment right um, this may not always be possible like i said but it's important to notice uh, you know sort of empathize with the customer uh, understand where they're coming from uh, before you know sort of only telling them about your product and your solutions right um, and then cherry picking those problems which makes sense within uh, the the context of your product uh, and translating them into uh, you know solutions that make sense within within that within that product's context right um, it is very very important here to not 
again, a, a, a hidden aspect here is sometimes you will have conversations with customers about, uh, you know, uh, this is especially when customers have already been using your product for a while, right? That they, they'll say, hey, you know what, what if you implement um, a, a particular uh, feature exactly this way? They, they are actually proposing a solution, right? And, and a PM has to have the conviction in those kinds of scenarios where let's focus on your problem, right? Uh, I can come back to you later with uh, you know a proposed solution, and then we can discuss that, of course. But let's focus on the problem. Let's get that out of the way first, uh, and, and then have a, a subsequent conversation about uh, the solutions, right? Uh, and you may also end up in situations where you have to say no to a solution that is proposed by a customer because it may not make sense in the product context, but uh, which is why it is very, very essential to uh, sort of have a keen handle on the on the problem first, right? Um, and then, as a result of all of this, if you if you if you show this empathy, uh, one of the, uh, the the aims of this is that uh, customers see you as uh, you know a trusted partner, a voice of reason. Uh, put a lot of uh, weight behind uh, your thoughts, etc. And then there are a lot of benefits that product manage managers can derive out of you know, such mutually beneficial relationships, right? Uh, especially in the B2B world, for example, you can get reference customers who can be your voice in the field, who can talk to other customers, uh, right? Uh, they can, you know, do the evangelism of your product uh, for you. You can also trust customers for early feedback if you're looking for feedback on a new feature that you're trying out. Um, poor man's A-B testing, for example, but, but with real users, right? Uh, perhaps even more important. Um, and then you can also withstand headwinds where you know, if a product is not doing as well, it's, it, functionality is not working, it's causing issues at a customer. The customer knows that as a PM, you're with them. And they can trust you, uh, and therefore, you know, avoid any headwinds that may uh, otherwise occur. Right? And then we already discussed how part of this relationship is also uh, that uh, a, a PM has the ability to say no, uh, and that's one of their key responsibilities as well, uh, especially when you know you get into solutioning con conversations for a variety of reasons, right? Uh, lack of critical mass, uh, not fitting into the overall vision of the product, et cetera. But even when you have these difficult conversations with customers, because you're a trusted partner, customers will be willing to have those conversations with you, right? So let's move on to the next one, right? Um, there is another one where uh, I have a lot of personal experience to share as well. Um, so a PM's job is to influence and negotiate with negotiate with stakeholders, influence your product team, uh, and, and steer them in a, uh, you know, towards a common goal, motivate them towards a common goal. But sometimes what happens is, um, and, and for good reason uh, in, in some scenarios as well, right? Which is, there are a lot of functions that PMs work with, you know, documentation, engineering, user experience. A PM might feel the urge to actually fill in one of those functions as well, because, you know, they want to be a team player. Um, and, and my, uh, you know, take on this is, is to proceed with caution. Um, and, uh, here is, uh, here are some of the reasons why, right? So, um, like we discussed, uh, the PM is sort of a leader of a cross-functional team, right? They have a lot of responsibility. They don't have direct authority over that team, right? Um, their job is to influence this cross-functional team and, uh, influence their roadmap, right? Influence their priorities uh, and negotiate with them towards a particular goal. You do that using data, you do that using uh, justification, evidence, all of that good stuff, right? Because they interact with all of these teams, uh, they have sort of a high level knowledge of all of these uh, functions, right? They have, you know, uh, engineering documentation, user experience, support, marketing, legal. Um, and, and what happens is because a PM is a highly motivated individual, uh, sometimes when one of these uh, functions may not be coming on board because uh, 
they have other priorities or because there is a lack of resourcing, uh, a PM may think that it is their job to fill in that function. They want to be a team player. They want to uh, you know, make progress. Um, and I've done this in the past, right? I, like I said, my background is a software engineer. I have a tendency where, you know, a uh, for example, a customer issue comes from a high priority customer. Um, I want to not disturb my engineering team. Uh, and this used to be me a couple of years ago, right? Which is, let's not sidetrack the engineering team. Let's keep them focused. Why can't I step in and, and build out the feature um, or, or build out uh, that bug fix or whatever that is, right? But what uh, goes sort of is, is, again, underrated is the term, is it's not about fixing something and giving it to a customer, right? Or it's not about building a feature and giving it to a customer. It's about what happens later. Can you support it for a sustained amount of time? Can you, uh, is there a repeatable solution? If, if a customer has a problem with something that you've developed, do you have uh, you know, resources to handle those problems? Right? Is, is the problem that you're working on even important at the point in time? Right? And th there are a lot of perils uh, to the substitution. Right? So, so like I said, from my example, uh, I, I clearly remember this uh, one situation that happened to me, which is uh, you know, I went in, implemented something, sent it to the customer, worked fine, right? A few days later, a few weeks later, we discovered that uh, there was an unintended side effect from that. And the fix for the side effect, unfortunately, was uh, uh, like we call as, as a blocker issue uh, that required a lot more investment than the original bug fix itself or the original fix itself. Right? Um, and, and, and so now I, I have to actually. Uh, you know, reprioritize a larger chunk of my engineering resources in order to you know, get this high priority fix out of the way, right? Um, so essentially, I think what happens in, in these scenarios is, one, it is taking time away from your data, day job, right? This is not your core responsibility, right? Um, it could lead to substandard results because that's not, you know, your primary skill set as a PM, right? Um, it can also lead to, Solutions that work, like classic case, the example that I mentioned, right? It can also work, uh, you know, at a point in time, they can solve a problem. But unless you have uh, some sort of uh, support plan, repeatability, right, as to you know, who is going to handle uh, uh, any requests that come from customers about, about you know, the thing that you, uh, you know, substituted for, um, it's going to be a problem, not just for, for you, but for uh, your larger product team, for, for customers as well, right? And then one of the other, perhaps even bigger sort of side effects of this is, as a PM, you might give the feeling to your cross-functional team that there isn't so much autonomy, that you're actually going and doing their job, right? And, and that can have, uh, in some scenarios, an extremely uh, drastic impact on, on team morale, right? So you have to be uh, very careful, right? Um, but having said that, it is a reality of times, especially in smaller companies, especially in new initiatives at larger companies where uh, you may have to substitute as a PM. My, my advice when you do, do that is, Proceed with caution. Make sure that you have a long-term plan. Once that is in place, uh, a temporary effort here and there might be good, uh, but also take your team into confidence and make sure that they know that you're doing this and, and we're adding this to the product and then the, the whole cross-functional team has to support it. And the last one for today is, uh, so, so we've spoken a lot about a PM's uh, job towards their product. Right, towards making their product a success, making their customers successful, uh, et cetera, as well. Uh, the last one is more about you as PMs, right? Um, or, or all of us as PMs, right? Uh, a PM is not a nine to five job. And, and, and I want to be very careful when I say this. 
the beyond nine to five aspect of the job is not necessarily for your product. It's not uh, what earns bread and butter for you, but it, it's what sets you up uh, for bigger and brighter success uh, for growth in future, right? Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about this, right? So, so we've discussed so far that uh, product management can be uh, a complex and high pressure job, right? Uh, there's also a dearth of education. There's not a lot of courses on product management, right? Uh, that's slowly changing, but you, you don't get out uh, with a degree in product management uh, typically. Uh, there are certifications that have started now. Uh, product school has started something, um, but but that's all uh, you know very recent, right? Um, so, and then in the role itself, there is a lot of fluidity. Uh, each industry has its own way of doing product management. Each business type has its own way. Uh, a startup has its way versus a large company has its way, right? Um, and so it, it all, you know, the role itself can be a kitchen sink of responsibility. Say, if something cannot be done uh, by a different team, uh, by, by, by a different function, or maybe it's the responsibility of the PM, right? That's also the tendency. How great PMs navigate this, uh, you know, these responsibilities is, is with an insatiable urge to learn, right? Um, and, and what they do is, you know, beyond their day job, right? They invest in their career, right? They invest in learning. They invest in keeping up to date with, the market, the domain that they want to excel at, uh, et cetera, right? They invest in personal growth. Uh, you cannot only rely upon organic growth from your day, day job uh, to grow as a PM, right? Uh, you may have, you have to invest in yourself, treat your, your career as, as a product itself. You have the skills of uh, product development and product management, right? Apply them to your career. Uh, focus on personal growth, uh, spend time uh, on market watching, you know, trends, new business opportunities, right? Uh, and this is outside, you know, what you do day to day, right? Um, domain knowledge, uh, uh, again, very, very important depending on uh, what domain you are in. Uh, you may want to spend time as to what, uh, to get a better understanding of that domain outside of your own product, right? Um, these days, this has become a little easier. There is no dearth of information on, on the internet. Right? There are lots of certifications, lots of product management journals, publications, uh, lots of key uh, personalities on the internet that you can follow and uh, you know get a lot of knowledge from. Uh, there's a lot of blogs. Uh, Twitter is great. Uh, Slack is great. Um, but above all, what I, my recommendation to you would be uh, get a mentor for yourself. That is, it is, uh, I, I cannot say this uh, enough. Uh, it is extremely critical. And on the other side also, once you feel like uh, you are in a good place, think about getting to the other side of the table as well. Be a mentor, share your knowledge. Uh, you know, that, that also helps you grow, right? Um, so essentially invest in yourself. Um, so that was it uh, for, for today. Uh, here are some, some links that I really, really found uh, interesting, not just in relation to this talk, but uh, also wider uh, you know, implications to product management. And, and some of these have made me, I feel a much better product manager than I was a few years ago as well. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for listening in today. Uh, it was great sharing some of these. Uh, tidbits with you. Hope uh, you found it useful. Um, have a great rest of your day.